So this morning's passages, as we heard, were 2 Kings chapter 5 and the Acts of the Apostles chapter 26, verses 1 to 23. Now, I thought I'd just offer a few brief reflections rather than a full sermon on our readings this morning to fit with the format. And I'd like to suggest that there is a thematic link between our Old Testament reading, the healing of Naaman, and our New Testament reading, St Paul's court testimony and the account of his conversion. That link is testimony. Both Naaman and St Paul were were both miraculously healed and those healing them then led them to conversions and giving testimonies and proclaiming the faithfulness of God in their lives. The healing of Naaman leads to the confession of the God of Israel as a unique God and the healing of St Paul leads to his conversion and then testimony. I'd now like to zoom in on our Acts reading. We read that all scripture is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction and for training in righteousness. But how is this passage in particular relevant and relatable for us here today? Unlike St Paul, I myself haven't suffered persecution for being a Christian. And neither have I persecuted Christians. I did not have a sudden or dramatic Damascene conversion either. So why shouldn't I just let this reading wash over me and pass me by? Why is this reading good news for me? How is it relevant? Why has God chosen to preserve it and keep it within his word? Well, on all of these questions and more, I'd like to suggest that there can be some key lessons that we can all learn from this passage today that equally apply. The first is that none, no one at all, is beyond the reaches of God's mercy. If even St Paul, a self-confessed persecutor of Christians, can be saved, then there is clearly hope that we can too. The second is that no matter what we have done, and no matter how guilty we may feel about it, God will forgive us if we earnestly seek his mercy and if we repent truly in our hearts. However, that forgiveness is not just a simple matter of forgetfulness or of amnesia. To forgive is not to forget. It is to remember without bitterness and to refuse to let the past enslave the present and the future. We are more than the sins we have committed, and with God's help, we can transcend them and escape their stranglehold on us. As the theologian Rowan Williams writes, The gospel will not ever tell us that we are innocent, but it will tell us that we are loved. It asks us to make our own love's comprehensive vision of all we are and all we have been. We must accept what we have been so that all of it can then be transformed. Grace will remake, but not undo. Grace will remake, but not undo. Thirdly and finally, I'd like to shockingly suggest that we are, in reality, not all that different from St Paul himself as we might like to piously think today. It is easy for us to hear this passage and to sit on our armchairs of complacency on the sidelines. However, we need to grasp the magnitude of our own sin and its sometimes hidden effects on others before we can truly appreciate the wonder of God's glorious gospel. As the Danish Christian philosopher Søren Kierkegaard proclaims, God in heaven, let me really feel my nothingness, not to despair over it, but to feel all the more intensely the greatness of your goodness. We need to acknowledge our need of salvation before we can be saved. If we skip past this step, if we fast forward it, the gospel and our passage this morning in Acts will seem irrelevant, pointless, and certainly not applicable to us. 
Often, we choose to fast forward over our own sins and instead conveniently focus on the seemingly bigger sins of others. As they are clearly more sinful than us, so we don't need to worry. Surely our sins are small fry in comparison. We like to deceive ourselves and lie to ourselves in this way. We then get into a trap where we think that the only sins which matter are the ones which we happen to commit in public and which immediately, directly and obviously harm others. But in the scriptures we read that if we have no sin, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Trying to hide our sins, as we learn from Genesis 3, from God, is actually a totally futile exercise, because he is the omnipresent God. He is everywhere and he sees everything. No corner of this earth, no square inch of this world, is away or apart from God. He made it all, he is present to it all, and he sees it all. So we think, we like to think, that this gospel thing is clearly intended for other people. For so-called big sinners like St Paul, but not for us. We're above that. I was brought up in the faith. I've already got it, thanks. I've learnt it, and now I can move on to new things. I've graduated the gospel. That's what we say to ourselves. However, the story of St Paul is a corrective to this, and it reminds us rightfully that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and that all our sins, both those of commission and those of omission, that's active and passive sins, the things that we've done and the things that we have not done, we've neglected to do, matter deeply. They are not unseen, unheard or ignored by God. Yes, there is of course a hierarchy of sins. Yes, some sins are clearly more grievous and more harmful than others and we see that affirmed multiple times in scripture but that does not then mean that our sins are unimportant or insufficient because they are not the worst sins we still need god's mercy just as much as anyone else even though the sins for which we need that mercy may differ circumstantially We sin in our lives just as frequently as St. Paul did, and our sin is ever before us, as the scriptures proclaim. It is immaterial, in a way, that our sins happen to differ from those of St. Paul. St. Paul also reminds us here that there is a wafer-thin line between good and evil, which runs down the heart of every man and woman. We would like to pretend that it is awfully simple, that we can easily spot the evildoers and the virtuous cohort, so that we can then separate them and condemn the polar opposite evildoers. A Manichaean dualism, if ever there was one. However, we are all at times close to being a devil and at times near sainthood. As the Russian author who was exiled, Solzhenitsyn, writes, Confronted by the pit into which we would throw those evildoers, we halt, stricken dumb. It is after after all only because of the way that things happen to work out that they were the executioners and we weren't. Let us therefore learn the lessons of St Anthony the Great. Let us hold in common the same eagerness not to surrender what we have begun, rather as though making a beginning daily, let us increase our dedication. For the entire lifespan of men is very brief when compared with the age to come. Let us therefore earnestly plead to God to grant us true repentance in word, in deed and in spirit, so that we may once again return to him. Amen. Amen.